Good afternoon and welcome to the Charles William Press Hall. Let's uh, hear from Director Condolet. We have uh, very serious and uh, respectable officials of government here to brief you on different issues from different sectors. Of course, key among them is the Ministry of Finance, led by the Acting Minister, Mr. Myers, the Acting Inspector General of Police is also here, as well as the Acting Boss of the LDEA. I'm told why they're supposed to be here, I don't see them here. Um, so we've got a full house, and I wouldn't want to take much of the time because I want these uh, distinguished officials to be able to exhaust what they came for. But let me just talk about a few issues before I, I invite them. As you all will be aware, the National Legislature has been on their break. Uh, but the President, uh, His Excellency President Waka, has already issued a proclamation calling them back for a special section. Uh, that section is set to commence this Thursday and will run until September 19. Uh, it is called in response to critical national issues, including the proposed recast budget that requires immediate attention and that cannot be kept waiting until the regular legislative session to resume in approval. Uh, the proclamation uh, that was issued is in accordance with Article 32B of the Liberian Constitution, which grants the President the authority to extend or call a special section of the legislature upon receiving a certificate signed by at least um, one fourth of the total membership of each chamber of the House and Senate. Uh, that certificate has been duly received by the President, which has now prompted the extraordinary section of the legislature. Uh, the President has emphasized the importance of this section uh, because um, matters of national interest and those that concern the welfare of the people will always be prioritized by the government. There are about three weeks that is expected to be used will provide an opportunity for the legislature to act on key concerns affecting the national fiscal stability and the development agenda. And so, just so you know, the legislature will be back beginning this coming Thursday. The government started the anti-corruption drive. It is something that we take very seriously. And we said here over and over at the press conference that no amount of threat about resistance, no amount of description uh, as to how people see a calling will make us a change course. And it is not something that say President Buaka or the executive is trying to impose. Uh, we do have statutory institutions of government like the LACC the um, GSC, the IAA, all of the institutions that are supposed to play key roles as far as accountability is concerned, all we're doing is to bring them the space and the independence to do their work. And they've been proceeding very well. Of course, as you all may know recently, the LACC, having done some background investigation concerning the supplementary payroll as the Minister of State for Presidential Affairs invited the former minister uh, to answer some questions uh, as uh, it relates to what they believe are some issues concerning that situation. Uh, we know that he appeared, but then we've just learned as a government that after that appearance, he has taken flight to the High Court and has requested the court 
to prohibit uh, the investigation that was commenced. The, it is important for you to know some of the things that were being investigated. Uh, there were allegations of payroll departing and acts of corruption resulting from salary payment affecting the supplementary payroll containing 728 names at the Ministry of State for Presidential Affairs. Uh, the supplementary payroll was allegedly created outside of the framework of the civil service agency, and that is according to the LACC. Uh, the, in their communication with Mr. Magui, they accepted that details of the allegation revealed uh, that the supplementary payroll was created under the instructions of the former minister, uh, and that the process was marred by irregularities amounting to payroll partly administrative malpractice and act of corruption among others. Um, he was cited by the LACC on August the 21st. He honored the invitation. However, uh, we learned that he has filed a petition for an alternative rate of prohibition before the Honorable Supreme Court, among other things, to inhibit, restrain, and prohibit the LACC from proceeding with their investigations against him. His principal argument is that he was a principal assistant to the former president at the time of the alleged corruption act and that if there were acts of corruption surrounding the payroll pardon process that the LACC are investigating, those acts were committed at the behest of the former president. And according to him, since the former president is constitutionally immune from prosecution, he as a principal assistant to the then president who acted on the instruction of the president is immune from any kind of investigation, whatever as long as the president cannot be investigated. He too, as principal assistant, should not be investigated. We are told that is the argument. His argument also goes to the extent to say that um, he acted on the orders of the president, who is constitutionally in me, and therefore he too hates. Well, we want to state that we will respect the process that has unfolded since he went to the court. We commend him for doing so. Maybe if we're taking everything to the court, the situation we experienced the other day in Sinko would never have been experienced. So we commend him for that. And that while we allow the legal process to take place as a government, we have our own thought process. And that we believe that there is no immunity for unlawful acts, especially for agents who claim to act on behalf of their principles. I mean, assuming President Walker just called me and said, go and shoot Devil's War. I know that shooting Devil's War and killing him is a crime. It's an act that is unlawful. Should I kill him and come back and say, I did it upon the destruction of President Walker and therefore I should be immune from persecution? The reasoning doesn't look okay to us. So we believe that he does not have that entitlement that he's claiming unto himself. Um, when you are an officer or agent of the state, you are simply under obligation to obey lawful orders. When an order is unlawful, you have a legal duty to refrain because your conduct would that be protected by law? So the Ministry of Justice, uh, the ISCC and the court uh, will be led to absolve the state of this case. And we are hoping that in the end, somebody will be held accountable. I mean, let's look at the reasoning as I lay this issue to rest. There's an accusation against you. You believe you are innocent. And the only way that can be used to establish that you are an innocent person is to allow the law to take its course. But you say, no, don't do no investigation, leave it. Because
because I was protected from doing what I did. In our thinking as a government, it is a kind of emission of guilt. In other words, you say, I did this thing, but I did it upon the instruction of this person. And sometimes as a country, we are quick to forget. You all follow the Brandon Salmon Cass situation. There's a lot of noise about that as to what or why he did was ordered by the former president and he was held accountable. He won an election. He should have been seated. His victory was reversed because of what he was reported to have done. Of course, some people said upon the orders of the person who was in boss then. And the same people who executed those things come back today and they want to turn the wheel around. When it suits you, it's okay. So we believe that the right thing will be done. Our team will go to the Supreme Court as requested and the necessary arguments will be raised and we'll see where we'll go from there. But what it tells us is that someone somewhere guilty afraid, does not want to be held accountable, and they say, oh, court, stop them from investigating me. We're not sure that's how it works, and as a government and as a team, we're not, we are not sure that we're lying to work that way, but again, the court will decide, because we all should respect the court, particularly the Supreme Court. The next and maybe final issue I want to talk about is um, what many of you called me about over the weekend. And I said, if we should have something to say about it, say at the press conference. And you all wanted to know what the government thinks about the fact that the former president uh, wrote ECOWAS, basically complaining about different issues. We know there was an issue in the DEA and police uh, officials are here, they're going to talk about it in a small town community. I'm sure when the camera they will give you a clear picture as to what happened. They've said it before, but you will hear more of that. And so, relying on that incident, the former president writes, accusing police of invading or raiding his headquarters. I'm not sure that what happened. They are here, they will explain. Initially, some of the party officials were saying people died. I expected that you journalists would have held them to account for the things they say. When a human being dies, the body does not turn to spirit. You will see the body. But these are all part of the strategy to make this place to look ungovernable, to spread lies and false rule, so that it excites or incites people to do the wrong thing. Maybe if they if they had chosen that part of writing the very letter from the beginning, we would not have seen what we, we saw happening. And that letter goes on to talk about other things, uh, targeting people in civil service, putting them down. You want to make the CDC to disappear. You want to break the party down. The president that was elected has a huge job to do because this country was almost non-existent in the last six years. To put it back together requires full attention. And no one who wants to reverse the kind of situation we find ourselves in will be wasting their time running behind a political party. They got so much to do. So those kinds of loose and reckless allegations there are things that we are allowed to just pass through because we have an obligation to ensure that the public is not misinformed. If police did not raid your company and you say they did it, we have an obligation to come and say you lie. If nobody died in a particular fracas and you say somebody died, we have to come and say you lie. If people that you appointed in these anti-graph institutions who are doing their work. You try to portray them as agents of a group of leaders who you say want to wish on you and we know they are lying. We say you lie. 
But there's one other positive side about it. A little bit right. <laughs> Trying to recognize an institution that they have disrespected so much during the last six years they were in office. When Liberian citizens who felt aggrieved and offended by their actions went to the very ECOWAS through some of their institutions. And they said, this is what you've done wrong, correctly. Did they ask? Was Captain Janet paid as ruled by the ECOWAS court? Was Nancy Doe paid as ruled by the ECOWAS court? It is the same ECOWAS. So much so, disrespected, in six years, that you not expect to be an authority that you can go to. It's good. And see, the difference is, we are a responsible member of the Committee of Nations, including our affiliation with ECOWAS. So when people take redress to ECOWAS, and they adjudicate those concerns and they come back to us with recommendations, unlike you, we listen. So it's a good thing that you now see ECOWAS as an entity you are supposed to respect when you didn't respect them yesterday. This attempt to create a kind of semblance of this country being a lawless state will not suffice. And you can hear all you want. And we can't we say the truth? They don't have the intellectual capacity to discuss the issues. What do they do? They go and insult. That's normal for some of us now. And you can insult the president of the country and everybody else. Who cares about your insult to an individual like us? We're not in an insult battle with you. We're here to inform the Liberian people of what happenings in the country because that is the responsibility for the Ministry of Information, Cultural Affairs, and Tourism. And with me, as the Supreme Leader, the Commandant of this place, supported by all these great men and women, we're not falter in our responsibility. We keep our charge, we keep it effectively, we're not propagandists. I've said when I went for a confirmation hearing, when I come to the British information, I will come to communicate because government should not be involved in propaganda. We just have to be factual. Be consistent with that. And if you think the strategy is to manufacture lives. 24-7, you have a team that will take charge of that 24-7. Having said that, let me invite the Minister of Finance, Acting Minister of Finance for the Government Planning, Minister Myers. Minister Myers is done. The Acting Head of the LDEA will immediately come over. And then the Police Acting Act, you will come over. And after that, you will have the opportunity to ask some questions. Minister Myers. and uh, members of the MIGAT management team. And we say thank you to our friends in the media. And we say good afternoon to Liberians at home and abroad. We've come to acquaint you with recent developments in our fiscal management space, as well as our macroeconomic developments. So there are three main things that we will speak to this afternoon. And the first one is, if you check on the IML website today, you will see a press release indicating that they and us, that is the Liberian Financial Management Authorities, i.e. Ministry of Finance and Central Bank of Liberia, have reached what they call staff level agreement which may at the management level of the IMF, we have agreed with them to resume the extended credit facility. So what is left now is for the management to take the proposal for this 40 month or three and a half year project, financial management reform project to the board of the IMF, which we meet on September 25th. Now, what is the ECF? What the ECF does is it provides 
as a need mitigate credits to bridge financial gaps, to close financial gaps. And some of these gaps, for example, are the central bank reserves. The central bank reserves are used for two main purposes. One, to keep the financial sector stable. All the commercial banks, <laughs> at one point or the other, they run low on their own reserves. And the central bank can give them short-term facility until they rebuild their reserve and pay back. All of us here almost have a bank account. And you will not want to wake up one day and hear that your bank has closed. And you know what that means for you financially. So the extended credit facility will ensure that the central bank has sufficient reserve to stabilize the financial sector. And another benefit of the ECF is to support our balance of payment. Liberia is a country where most of our commodities that we use in all categories, whether consumables or non-consumable commodities, are imported. You want to talk about rice, you want to talk about petroleum, all the clothes that we are wearing here are all imported, and even all your gadgets. And these have to be funded with foreign exchange. Business people who bring in these goods need to acquire foreign exchange. And they have to get it through their banks or other business transaction. So the foreign reserve, which will be supported and portrayed by the ECF, will help us to ensure that we have regular amount of foreign exchange to fund, finance our international payments, whether it's financing imports or international transactions like our debt payment to other institutions and etc. And also, on the macroeconomic front, it will help to stabilize our exchange rate. Because once it is known that there is sufficient amount of foreign exchange for the central bank to use in intervening in the financial sector, it will be very hard for business people or other individuals to go on the black market to look for US dollar, which thereby drives the exchange rate up. And when the exchange rate goes up, it goes up with inflation. Because the cost of imports become high, and therefore their prices in Liberian dollars also become high. So that is one important benefit of the ECF. How did we get here? I will say briefly. So in December 2023, then President elect Joseph Yuma Boyka asked that he wants Liberia, he wanted Liberia to re-engage with the fund and to resume the ECF program. Because it was started in 2019 under the previous administration. And in this room a few weeks ago, someone asked me the question about the inflation and other things. At that time, between 2019 and 2022, when the ECF was in place, our exchange rate was stable, inflation was low. But in 2022, when the previous authorities failed, in meeting the requirements of keeping the program going, the program was suspended. If I collapsed, and we saw exchange rate going up, we saw inflation rate going up, we saw import prices rising. So in February, the IMF fielded a special mission, an assessment mission, to come and engage with authorities of the Ministry of Finance, the CBO, and other key institutions of government. And it was agreed in that assessment meeting that yes, the country will be ready to resume the ECF program. And so all the documentations were prepared. We exchanged the necessary information and data. And in July, a full-fledged negotiating team came to library. Actually, June 29th to the 5th of July. And that team spent I'm going to get right, June 25th to the 5th of July, two weeks in the country, and discussing with all of the key stakeholders, including the president and some key members of the cabinet. And it was agreed that all the necessary formalities were almost in place with few outstanding issues. And what was some of the outstanding issues? Uh, let me just list them. On the fiscal side, they wanted us to recast the budget because from our own assessment as at the end of June, 
the revenue forecast towards the end of the year was going to be less than what we budgeted at the beginning of the year. So in order to do so, we needed to rebalance the budget to make sure that there is a match between revenue and expenditure. So recasting the budget was one fiscal requirement. And another one was to identify ways and means that we can finance the revenue shop for so that expenditures will not have to be cut. Because at that time, in the middle of the year, when ministries are still more or less in transition, preparing for the implementation of the arrest agenda, it will be distorting to have a reduction in expenditure. So we needed to find means of closing the revenue gap. And the third was to identify some ways of financing our domestic debt. Because all of you remember, at the passage of the budget, there was a drastic reduction in domestic debt, which affected the stability of the various banks for which government owe various debt instruments. And it also affected the ability of the banks or contractors especially to assess credits from the banks to finance critical projects. So part of the recast process required raising the amount that was allocated for domestic debt by almost 100%. So those were the three cardinal requirements on the fiscal side which were all accomplished. As you remember, the minister mentioned we submitted a recast budget two weeks ago. Yes, a copy of it is now with the legislature. I'm going to resume this week. This is going to be one of the key national issues that we'll be discussing. And in the recast budget, all the adjustments to the various critical lands have been made and it's now before the legislature to deliberate on. Then on the monetary side, there were issues about credits extended to various commercial banks, some of which you are familiar with in the media, two banks, and the issue was whether or not the CBO acted legally, legally in the context of their own act and the rules that govern those kind of transactions. So to all intent and purposes, negotiations are still ongoing between, on the one hand, the CBL and those two banks, and then between the CBL and the MFDP. Because at the end of the day, the CBL is the government's bank. When they have difficulties with their reserve position, the Ministry of Finance will be compelled to support. All banks can fail, but the central bank of any country should not fail. So that conversation is ongoing. But what has accelerated the process to bring us this far is a father, the president, to decisive actions with regard to changing the management of the central bank. So our colleagues at the front, the IMF, were concerned whether the management team then were really committed to undertaking the kind of radical changes or radical reforms that, would, that was needed. Not reform as to changing anything, but simply putting the bank back on track in performing its legislated duties, functioning as it was meant to function. We've heard all the reports, we read about it, where over the counter transactions exceeded 170 plus millions. No central bank does that. And then the next thing was to review how the central bank supports and supervise commercial bank generally. So in the case of one of the bank, SRB for example, the CBO is going to tighten the management, not take over the bank, no. They are going to rather do more closer regulatory supervision of the bank to ensure that decisions taken at the bank do not run contrary to the procedures required for the functions of the bank. So, what needs to be done now with respect to the next step forward, having reached the staff level agreement? So, the Ministry of Finance representing the government, the Ministry of Finance and the CBL, 
representing the financial governance of the country, we had to submit a formal letter requesting for the resumption of the program. And this is a letter that will be taken to the board on September 25th for approval. And then there are various technical recommendations which are mainly related to the functions of the MFDP and the CBL that we've agreed changes that have to be made. And I must tell you also why the two entities will be leading their requirements for other institutions of government that kind of underpin the PFM process that we will be coordinating as well. Uh, the details are too numerous, we don't want to bore you with that. And then, uh, just a few items, the ECF. What will it benefit the country? I highlighted the monetary aspect, for example, supporting the reserve positions and facilitating our international payment and stabilizing the exchange rate. So, one of the things that going to happen is, a more like restore or improve our credit rating in terms of our ability to do prudent fiscal management. Because agreeing to the terms of the ECF signals that both the Finance Ministry and the Central Bank of Liberia are ready to undertake financial management in a way that is responsible, in a way that is prudent, and in a way that is judicious. Judicious means consistent with the legal principles governing the two institutions. So once you do that, you open the door for direct budget support. You open the door for low interest concessional loans. You open the door to other non-financial technical cooperation. Because our partners out there will begin to see that, oh yeah, there are serious people in charge. There are serious people who are ready to manage their own resources well. So therefore we can trust them with our own resources, with our resources. The second one is that uh, it provides opportunity for external support to the implementation of the President's agenda, the arrest agenda. As you know, we've already concluded the national and local consultations. The drafting on the plan is now in process. We are expecting it to be ready to be linked to 2025 budget so that expenditures will be in line with the plans for 2025 to 2029. So the ECM program provides resource opportunity for that. And in addition to the supporting the financial sector, it also provides, prima I said, to bridge financial gaps. There are economic potential in the country. Local and international investors who want to venture in any of these areas, agenda for example, whether agriculture, whether rural, and other economic ventures. The facility under the ECF can be used by the central bank to facilitate medium and long-term credits into viable economic projects that will re re make returns to be used to replenish whatever will be used. So in a way, in addition to financial management improvement, it also helps to tap into the potential of the economy. And they also help to increase our allocation with other financial institutions. You hear about the International Development Association. We'll talk about the issue later on, how we defaulted, quote unquote. Allocation from the African Development Bank, from the International Finance Corporation, and other institutions that lend short, I mean, low interest loans or give grants. This project, this program, will increase the allocation that Liberia has in this institution. And like I mentioned, also donor confidence. They improve donor confidence. Now to the depth, and to this, I will just speak to you broadly, and my colleague, Mr. Zuo, will give you a bit more details, and he's in charge of debt management. Now the issue of debt, did we default? No. Again, as Minister Pierre mentioned, we are still confronting legacy issues from the past. In addition to 
over the counter transactions. When the Central Bank of Liberia or any country makes international transfers, it should not be to my personal account. If it is over personal account, it should be legitimate authorized. Maybe I'm on a foreign tour and I will be there for a while and I have to set up an account to do all my transactions in. But not to my family, not to friends, not to purchase my cars or any commodity abroad. So previously, we were making transfer throughout the week, Monday to Friday. And through that, we could make transfer to our embassies abroad, make transfer to our board, I mean creditors as we settle the debt on a periodic basis. But because of the irregularities at the Central Bank, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is the CBO's corresponding bank in the States, restricted the transfer window to two days a week, Friday and Wednesday. So what that means is that the due dates for certain payment, even if we have the cash, sometimes may not coincide with the transfer dates allowable. I can give you an instance where the controller and accountant general, Mr. Nettie, actually captured the picture of a check that was ready to be paid to one of our lenders. He sent it by screenshot to the country manager. And they said, no, what they are interested in is a swift code. Unfortunately, that was not on the transfer date. So when people go around, Say the government of Liberia or the Federal Ministry defaulted. You got to be better. And to be frank, most of you here were police at a certain point in the media. You both not doing what you should do. The Ministry of Finance is down on Broad Street. There is a media director of patients. You all know. Capturing information on Facebook and publishing it is not right for this country. The last time I was through here, I talked about something about the signaling effect. Certain information, when it goes out, the economic implications is worse than you think. International economic issues, or even domestic economic issues, you should have the fact. Conveyors of wrong information are equally guilty of whatever consequences it costs. We didn't default. We are on time with our payment. And a secondary information that you need to know, the over for the over for the five million that we are paid in this year, more than 50% of that is for debt that was scheduled to be paid in 2023, but we're not paid. A lot of men were raised, vouchers were raised, and they didn't pay the debt. Because the creditor, the, all of us say, if you have a loan with the bank, you have Monday schedules for payment. So all the payments, or most of the payments that were scheduled for 2023 were not paid. If for the five plus million of this year, 23 million are for what was to be paid last year. So who defaulted? Not us. You know who defaulted. Finally, okay, we already talked about the recast budget, and uh, probably Mr. Zoe, you can just take five minutes to briefly talk about any issue on the debt that they didn't cover, a big old detail. But before I step down, we invite you, patience is here, I know her, you'll be visiting us and get it fast. Thank you. I know Mr. Myers has actually said all, but this is something important for this country for the public to know. Most often, Liberia would think that because we deal with cash all of the time, we are the rich people. But globally, people look at you when you are able to live up to your commitment and what we call credit, and also tie to your credibility or whatever you do. President Barca took over this year. You know that the United Party led government actually left like the debt after for the two 
4.2 billion have been waived during Madame Salif administration. The entire 12 years, the government accumulated 881 million debt. You, you'll be surprised as librarian, but let me say this to you. In six year period, CDC led government accumulated 1.5 billion debt. And you and I can search all around here to see whether the money that, have, that was disbursed, whatever was accumulated as debt, you can see it physically, or you can even find anyone who can tell you say, this is a major investment. <coughs> Something that all of us are supposed to be aware of, especially the young generation. I'm emphasizing on the young generation because I'm in my 50s. I have struggled, and I'm going to I graduated from the lower level of poverty based on what I can earn today. But if I don't manage it well, my children, my generation will be responsible to pay whatever life I live today. And that's what is happening to this country. So as Mr. Meyer said, we inherited huge amount, 2.6 billion debt. And we have to do it cautiously to build the credibility of this nation by reassuring our partners and telling them that we'll pay your money on time, give us time to do this. And that is something that all of us here did not know when people are just passing the street with it. Can you imagine, we are sitting here today as Liberian, spending more than $44 million just to pay debt. It means we are foregoing all the things we're supposed to use, money we're supposed to use to build hospitals, to actually build schools, to provide food for children, even for prisoners. We forgo here because someone had actually spent this money before, which of course all of us here are supposed to be asking ourselves, how are we using our money? Besides the, the argument of D40, which I don't want to go to the minister actually explain it to us, one of the issues I just want to bring into the press today in Liberia is that many of us have seen it across the country. If we don't listen to what the president told us as manager of the economy, we're going to land into a wrong hand. The money that is given today by the IMF, a $206 million to build our reserve, is because just October last year, or December last year, the government took in $3 million from the reserve of this country, in addition to other money, just to pay civil servants. Will you all believe that? It means that, let me just give a simple illustration to the library people who are listening to me. You see, reducing your reserve is almost like having low blood as a human being. When your blood is low, what happens to you? You tend to get sick. And that means you will not function well. It's always important for you to protect your reserve. And this is the reason why this administration has fought very hard to go on the, the ECF program to make sure that we have our reserve protected, we have better macroeconomic functioning of the state, that the economy remains stable that you and I cannot go out of money to spend on productive activity for this country. So that's a little emphasis I want to give on the debt issue. Because in addition to that, we have a situation in this country that even the domestic debt, we're talking about extended. The domestic debt we inherited is so huge. Out of one, I mean 2.6, $1 billion is added domestic debt. If we check, what it simply does is that people who are making businesses, we're taking away money from them, we are staffing our library businesses. They won't be effective at all. It will reduce the possibility of people even employing people. Some people will work today and they will not take pay because government owned them. And there are some contractors who actually were doing construction work for this country but they could not even redeem whatever you know, a commitment they made to banks. And their asset was seized. How can you live in an economy like that you say you're managing it? Or simply because few people want to have cash in their pocket and staff for other people. 
And that's one of the reasons why we call it rescue mission, that we are here to rescue this economy. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sophia and the Mika family. It's good to be here at this time. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, in addition to the government of Liberia's statement release on August 22nd, 2020, regarding the incident in small town community, the LDA on August 21, 2024, applied for a search and seizure warrant to the West Point Magisterial Court regarding a property identified in small town community. As a, as a result of this application, the search and seizure warrant was issued on August 21, 2024, and that said warrant was accompanied by two officers of the Western Magistrate Court who joined the LDA agents on August 22, 2024, to execute the warrant at the intended property in small town community, Common Town. We are informed that when the LDA team arrived at the small town community and was making its way to the intended property, the team got violently resisted by suspected community members who pelted stones and at one point fired at the agent. At this point, between 5.30 to 5.45, the agents maneuvered and pulled out as there were already roadblocks staged along the Benazby route as well as the Tottenham Boulevard in front of the CDC headquarters. As a result of these resistances, two agents of the LDEA sustained injuries. And we can show you these pictures. You can see them. They were taken to the JFK Medical Center where they were treated, discharged, uh, but continued to seek daily follow-up treatment with that facility, we wish them speedy recovery. Regarding the issue of the warrant, the LDA agent in charge of the operation did submit an application to the West Point Ministerial Code, whose ministerial officers processed the warrant and represented to the agents of the readiness of the warrant, which was accompanied by two officers of said code. The warrant was directed to a particular target in the small town community and not the Congress for Democratic Change. We say this again. The warrant was directed to a particular target in the small town community and not the CDC. The issue of jurisdiction is always raised before the courts. It is a usual legal practice, but yet the writ was not served because of the violent resistance. However, the agency is now doing its after action review to ensure that it doesn't only rely on representation of courts, ministerial officers regarding the processing and issuance of rates uh, as done in this case. And then in other development, on August 21, 2024, the agency arrested an, an, an Ivorian on, in sink on 18th Street uh, who was in possession of Kush and heroin amounting to US 100, $117,000. He's been investigated, charged, and sent to court. Since we took over the agency uh, from June to date, we've been able to seize about drugs value about 1.5 million US dollars. I think that should be a breaking news to right? So this is the agency efforts to, to, to reduce, uh, to, to contribute to supply reduction by ensuring that the traffickers, dealers, the distributors, the capacity uh, to trade drugs are weakened and diminished. To date, the LD has also secured 13 convictions across the country. We got nine convictions in Lofa, three in River G, and one in Wapol of drug suspects, those who were arrested and sent to court. So the DEA remains committed to combating drugs, related crimes in affected communities across the country, and call on everyone to join the agency's effort. Thank you. We'll be standing by for your questions subsequently. Thank you very much.
So before I begin with uh, nobody died on Thursday, about 22nd. Nobody enters the city for found. And uh, we are going to go to school right now. Thank you for the invite. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in some says that uh, wisdom is better than strength. And this means that uh, it's better to be wise and to be strong. Uh, wisdom is the ability to use knowledge and experience to make good judgment and good decisions. Uh, and this is what we did on August 22nd, 2024, last Thursday. On Thursday, August 22nd, 2024, at about 5 10 a.m. At about 5 10 a.m., we received a call from the field that some of our officers, traffic officers, that are usually deployed on the Thunder Boulevard every morning at 4 o'clock to control traffic, to get a free of traffic, came under attack by some of our impressions and it was manhandled. So we immediately dispatched a team of officers on the scene, and it was confirmed that two of our officers, Agustin Giampolo, patrolman, and patrolman Jala Masari, Jala Mali, Jala Mali. They were manhandled to their personal effect cell phones, money, and even their uniforms were all taken off around there. Upon our arrival, there are reports of stone throwing on vehicles flying the boulevard. Cars were smashed. And you can see the picture right here. Uh, we received a complaint from one Mr. Mohammed Masari, who uh, with contact number 07759886665 with lesson plate number A142252. We came at a car wash area at uh, Oro Junction, Oro and Boulevard Junction, and filed a complaint that his car was smashed while heading to Pins around 5 5.30 to 5.45 in the morning. But when you usually look at traveling in the morning, the general manager has to run there to bring food to the back to the, to the town. So while on his way, his student trains started occurring. His cars were splashed, so he went from people to the police. If you look on the board here, his picture is there, his car number is there, his lesson plate number is there, his cell phone number is there, you can contact him if you wish to. It was at this point we were informed that uh, the LDEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, has gone in that small town community around Bonanx Beach to conduct a raid and that they were overpowered by residents of that community and ran after them onto the main boulevard on the main thoroughfare. And when they got on the main thoroughfare, and the DA officer retreated, then they started uh, throwing stones and leaving roadblocks and burning tires in the street. So we were also informed that those who came on the roof initially and abducted two of our officers, Jala and Augustine, had retreated back to the CEC phone bar. And that uh, we do not allow our men to stay at large. If you go out of the war front and one of the men is missing, then you show that that man is free. You can get him at what cost. Otherwise, you have to be blamed. So we were all saying that all was calm because they had retreated in the CEC compound. We decided to go back to our command center. And where is our command center? Our command center is at the ERU base where we have the, the water and the sewer pump around the, uh, the invisible park. 
So we were just monitoring the situation. Because they had left the, 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 the main road and gone back uh, into the compound, so we thought it was calm. So we were there at about 6, 10 to 7 a.m. again. We got a report that they had come back on the road. A group of guys had come back on the road from the same compound and making roadblocks. And this time around creating stones all over, smashing cars again. But if you look on this go here, you'll see that JF, JFJ car that was going to work the money. Uh, they had occupants on that car. They smashed this car. They had two victims from, from this vehicle that were taken to JFK. And some of our officers, about 16 persons were wounded in that incident. So we being law enforcement officer, uh, we have the mandate to maintain law and order. And you have your right to go to work. Suppose they live in Pinsville, get a children to school in town. Suppose they live in town, get a children to school in Pinsville. Now we tell you gotta commute. The roads are blocked. Tires are running all in the street. Should we sit by and look at you surprise it? No. You know, we take for nothing money from you. Your, your, your tax payer, your tax that you pay will be free. So we have to maintain the law, to restore the law, to restore order. So it was when we moved in, one, to rescue our officer, two, to restore law and order, and provide free flow of traffic for commuters, for business people. So the situation was so, so, so serious that we had to keep officers in the street throughout the night. But if you look here, you'll see one dark picture here, just happening around now, Terry. Cardiac, cardiac theory, her car was smashed. Then uh, another, another car by the name of, of um, uh, come on. Another taxi driver, around nine o'clock, his name is, uh, uh, Nimsin Coco, TX06215, telephone number 0777-65969. 9643. He also reported a Zoom 3. Come on down. Um, this is his car. You think I see the, 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 the broken black stair on the road. I personally took this picture. Because our commander was one or two. Uh, while they're monitoring the situation and what is called. So this guy was hit while just going around that time after we thought that was calm. While going home, we passed us in the car. So I get in the same compound again and just smash his car. You are some three and they complain. Then by not telling it happened to Kadiato Tele. But why this Jeep was stolen again? It's a dead in her car. So all the incidents were reported. So we had to keep keep our, our men um, <clears throat> in the street up to 10, 11, 12. We had to ensure that we went the situation. So we want to abolish every citizen and residence to refrain from the idle violence. As it is, as by doing this, we just be doing harm to ourselves. We also want to assure the general public and the police we continue to remain professional and we are here to serve everyone and not one group of people. Okay, let's refrain from violence. Let's take, for instance, uh, yesterday there was a fire phone somewhere on the Somalia track. The people went and blocked the road. Is it police responsibility to, 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 to remove bodies? No, it is mutual sure help. But you block the road and deny all the road users. And this is not good. We gotta stop violence in this country. Go through the legal process. If you have a qualm, go to the law and seek for redress. And this is what we are here for, to maintain the peace. And we maintain the peace at all costs, no matter what happens. We maintain the peace. If you want to be violent, so what is your violent because what? Oh, nobody want to talk? <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's, let, let me say here that uh, nobody died, one, two, we did not enter CDC compound. The guy that was being portrayed on social media like he died, he is a JFK, he will be discharged today, and when he discharged today, tomorrow, you'll be going to put where you're charged in abstention. Uh, 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 what guy name? Prince Sami. Prince Sami. Prince Sami from Fiamma. The resident of Fiamma. He's a contractor. He tells us that he was not part of the demonstrator. He was not sending with the peace uh, 
the peace advocate, the women that were saying, oh, we want peace, we want peace. I will send just one, say, one piece, one piece, and you, you, get, you get injured. You just give them an alibi. So we say this, uh, let's refrain from violence. So let's try to be law abiding. And we're going to keep the peace. We will maintain the peace at what cost? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Maurice Wolaki and I report for Hope here. Uh, it's good to see all of you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, my first question goes to uh, Minister Myers. Thank you so much. Um, you know, while you were speaking, I was able to speak with uh, our legislative reporter, uh, and I observed, he told me that uh, he observed in a recast budget that was submitted to the legislature, that uh, the budget for the Ministry of Education, Health, uh, Agriculture, and other ministries, and the decrease yeah, so do you care to tell us what informed that reduction? And uh, to the uh, Liberia Jaws Enforcement Agency, you know, there's a rate circulating on social media and they saying that the rate came from the West Point Code, but it was reportedly stolen. Yes, so can you tell us? And you know, I'm talking about the DA. You look at me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about DA, uh, Mr. Mr. Peters. So can you clarify who actually signed that writ and you know, that that carried the DA at the summer time? So those are some of my questions. And maybe uh, Minister Myers or Minister Pia, uh, any of them can answer. You know, any person of the library returnees who were brought back uh, in the country uh, receive, did receive uh, their, their payment. Uh, but uh, when do we expect to see, um, there is a portion of them, portion of them, and you know, did receive, uh, when do we expect uh, the last batch to receive their payment? And, and lastly, uh, there are still people at the Butubura camp in Ghana, and I'm told that the authorities there sold the land in order that they are residing on. Uh, what are follow plans of the government to bring those people back? Thank you. Good afternoon. John Sheridan, several institutions, including the Charles Russell, Radio Monroe, the Live USA. Uh, one or two, I listen to you attentively. I just one, want you to one 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 one. one, one, one. William Kim Okay. So, how do you just oppose the principle of hot pursuit to what happened last week? And what about the compound of the CDC that has become so abominable that the hot pursuit, the principle of hot pursuit, cannot be pursued? Do you prefer two persons, one of whom was a former representative, defeated to having the rest of Liberian lives in Germany? I was on my way here last week for Mikat, predicated upon what happened. You are not on the way that traffic would detour. So as a result, I heard the minister, I did not see him. I wanted to have seen him and asked him questions. Look, man, you guys are trained. And I'm disappointed that you did not do what you had to do. So why didn't you not use the hot pursuit? Principle of hot pursuit. Thank you. Thank you. 
My name is Desmond Moyon, I'm called for Mazawi Wa. So my concern, first and foremost, goes to Mazawi Wa. My concern goes to the Minister of Information, that's the first concern. On yesterday, I visited the camp there in Johnsonville, that's the LGBRC camp, and there were so many reports about the issue of abandonment. And uh, these people who are librarians raised the concern. There's a good opportunity. Go ahead, go ahead. So, and then uh, they also alleged that they received some information from their boss, from the bosses of the LGBRC that they should instigate protests at the Ministry of Finance because they thought it's not now with LGBRC, it was the Ministry of Finance who was supposed to approve of that budget for them to be settled individually, receiving 300 USD. So I show the Minister uh, from Finance can also clarify that as to whether that case of uh, uh, the Ministry that was returning. As how far it is in terms of the budget so that they can be dispatched and resettled to that. No personal homes. To the, the LDA, to speak about the issue about the rate. You, it has also been alleged that the uh, rate is stolen. I don't know as to whether, just as you did the due diligence, you display photos of those people who were injured or were affected. If for any reason you, issue, you receive a rate from the court, don't you think it's also necessary that you could show the rate to this press, you could bring it along you to the press briefing, or if it was stolen, at what point in time did they get missing? They wrote after the protest, or better still, the government said before your action to the community of such arrest. And uh, lastly, to the LNP, the police right now is being described, or uh, one could say, uh, like, sorry, I don't know, but reckless, however, yes. Because if police that's supposed to be responsible mature enough to protect not just the state but the lives of the citizens of the state. And then if the presence of police at a crime scene, in fact, one would say escalated the entire tension. Some, of, some people got affected with lessons of few hundred librarians, including the pastor by the saying, well, just because of the police, I mean involvement, that whole thing went out of control. So are we to believe that NFP is no longer capable to resolve these issues in terms of protection of citizens' life? If so, why? Thank you. My name is Mr. Yare from Prime Finance. A couple of questions to the folks from the Ministry of Finance. The budget, the Kevin Law in Section 19 says the budget will be made available to the public immediately following your submission to the legislature. Has that been the case um, to uh, uh, Minister Myers and his team? Secondly, you spoke about the, the ECF, the extended credit facility that the Liberian government has reached the staff agreement with the IMF. I'm concerned now, uh, we enter the ECF, or we enter an agreement with the IMF, but not the ECF in 2019. Um, of course, we, you explained how it ended, but then the Borg administration has chosen to go into another arrangement, this time worth 209 million US dollars to be paid for a period. My question to you, uh, financial administrators of the state, is this ECF a long-term solution to our financial problems? Because they seem to address short and medium-term uh, financial issues. But long term, it, it doesn't seem to, to me that we're tackling the issues of job creation and, um, of course, our poverty we made. That, that's to the financial folks, to the police. Do you think your response to whatever was happening at the CDC headquarters on last Thursday was proportionate to the force used by the CDC? owing to the amount of tear gas canisters that were fired by the police, um, could that be justified as a proportionate force to the clearing of stones to the DEA? Uh, Mr. Peters and your team, was there a spillover from your operations in the small town community in the CDC's I didn't hear you say that. Thank you very much. Come back. Was there a spillover from your operations yeah, into it? Thank you so much. My name is Anthony Gray, and I work for the ECOWAS Radio. 
I uh, have two concerns. The first one is directed to the Ministry of Finance and Development. You said in 2023, uh, speaking of default, what you said in 2023, the monies that were to be paid by the previous administration were not paid. And you are saying that the government is not in any way default. How can we reconcile these uh, statements that this happened in 2023 and now we are into 2024, but this, these monies are not in the Speaking of 45 million in your tone, the LMP you charge is sent to uh, court for the presses with the crime of attempted murder, something that opinion leaders in the country, others have termed as uh, political prisoners. Uh, did you identify those individuals with, uh, with weapons in their hands to, I mean, make an attempt to kill someone? That you have charged them with these, uh, with, with, with these crimes, attempted murders, and others. Thank you so kindly. So, Mr. Peter, uh, a year. My, my name is Hugh Akwano. I'm a journalist in Liberia. My question says uh, when you went to the small town, you missed talent because you underestimated that you were going to be in a challenge. What can you say to that? and then to the police. In recent times, you've been uh, dismissing some police officers based on specifically on not carrying their helmet to reinforce the traffic law. There's this magazine we used to hear in the police force before say, police are uh, violence to reinforce. Is there anything between violation to reinforce and then uh, not using the helmet that you dismiss it? Thank you so much. My name is Robert Schumann. I report for Spoon FM. It's from TV. Uh, Mr. Myers, I, I, I want you to, uh, to address this concern. You know, you've been acting for quite a while now. And there's this uh, discussion that uh, a new minister of Malawi is coming to take your job. Uh, do you have interest in the in this job? Uh, if you are concerned, what do you have interest in this job? And to just put a spin on what my colleague uh, personally asked, um, the police in recent times, when there are issues to a particular place, the appearance of the police uh, each time seems to, you know, exacerbate the, 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 the situation. Uh, we have observed that recently at the CDC airports and other areas. I, I don't know what mechanism are you going to use to make sure that uh, this, you know, does not continue anymore. Because what happened that day was uh, the entire, all the businesses in that area were shut down, and the police was present, moving here back and forth with uh, just unarmed citizens. Good morning. Good afternoon. So this question is just a question for me to the I'm Judo Nikoli, I come from Prime uh, Honorable Peters, your range of ghettos, hollows and what have you usually end with sometimes injuries, sometimes sometimes innocent civilian being trapped, sometimes murder. Do you have any plan to re-strategize as to how you carry on your raid, your raid of ghettos, and what are you out? Can you being hurt? You said, ask you 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 said Yeah, so uh, uh, in Bannersville, in, in Bannersville, New Georgia Johnson, okay. around there, uh, some of your officers went there and then a guard got hurt and later died. He that and he responded to that as well. And then uh, usually uh, on Benson Street, people will, be, people will get hurt. And what I want to know why you have plans to re strategize how you go about your workings without harming innocent civilians. Thank you.
thank you once again. So, someone asked about why the RICA show a decrease in the overall allocation for a number of agencies, but he highlighted three health, education, and agriculture. The decrease will not affect, the decrease does not affect the ability of those ministries and agencies to function because the decreases were not to their core operational allocations. That is, goods and services and salaries. The decrease affected their appropriation for public sector investment plan or PSRP. And the decrease, as you can recall, when we stood here after the approval of the budget, we announced that there was an additional increase of 46.5 million made by the legislature based on various assumptions and assessment or reassessment of the revenue over and above what the MFDP and LRA talked to the legislature. We sounded a caveat, in fact the president signed a caveat that is published along with the budget. So the adjustments primarily affected the non-performing allocations, meaning allocations that are linked to the non-performance in the revenue. Because most of the other performance in the revenue that we announced that caused the recast were on no reassessment and increases made during the budget approval process. And it went mostly to PSRP. And realistically, with four months left in the budget and the revenue sources for those projects not performing, it's only logical to remove those lands. So all of the adjustment I see to these three ministries and other entities is mainly on the PSRP projects that were planned but may not be executed in full due to a number of reasons. Primarily, the sources of revenue earmarked for those projects are not performing. Two, the procurement and other preparatory activities to enable them or to qualify expenditure or disbursement for those projects are lit in preparation. We have four more months left on the budget. So that is the information behind the decrease. So goods and services, salaries and compensation, and other operational resources for those entities remain on touch. So the ministries will not close down. There will be no pay delay, etc. etc. The wrap for return refugees as a resettlement affected persons. We have been working with the Health privacy and the foreign ministry even before the refugees were returned. The two institutions made several trips to Ghana. We funded these trips off budget. The batches of refugees that were returned, we funded them off budget. And even the handshake or the resettlement that was that had been given to those who were in bunk, those who are in Mozzarella and some part of the Southeast are all being funded off budget. So there was an issue of management which we took with the L3 priority. We thought they didn't do it judiciously. I don't know how many of you here. Maybe let's say there are 40 or 50 journalists here. And maybe there's some be, there should be some appreciation of, say, $100 per person. That should be five hundred dollars, but Mika can only raise maybe four hundred or three hundred. So should you save just thirty persons and leave twenty persons out? We made it clear to the elder bureaucracy that that was not managing the situation properly. The head of every institution should be a situation manager. So whatever was the ratio of the disbursement we made to them. It should have been distributed proportionally among whoever were the number of persons affected. We express this to them in no uncertain terms, and we have been working with them behind the scene to find additional resources to settle 
the remainder of those persons who have been affected. We thought that was, in my own view, socially it was discriminatory. Because everybody affected the same way. Everybody need food, they need soap, they need transportation, whatever it is our refugees returning need, every single individual need it equally. So you can't settle one side 100% and leave others at zero. On the budget publication to the public, yeah, immediately, once we submit the budget to the legislature, on the same day, in fact, within the same hour, it is on our website www.mfdb.gov.lr. It has been there since the day we made the submission. I guess we're talking about mass publication and distribution. Of course, there's resource constraint, and we also, all of us in this age of climate concern, we have our environmental concerns as well, so we manage the use of paper. However, when the budget is approved and is about to be distributed, we may limited hard copies available. But you can access it on the on the internet of the of the ministry. The question about whether the ECF strategy is a long or short term solution. No, it is not. About two weeks ago, I was on Spoon FM in the night, and I made this illustration. I said, Liberians returning to death, where we accumulated more than two times. In six years, the amount of debt that was accumulated in six in twelve years. In fact, some of those debt accumulated in twelve years, now all creditors of the past waived their debt in 2010. Some kept their debt on the whole. The Arabs, for example, they said don't do their waiver. So there was around around 200 of a debt about debt that remained that was not waived with EP. So what the UP actually added on was just around between five and six hundred million. But like the minister mentioned, the road to Bikana, the road to Ganto, and all the other structures, the hydro dam, and many other things can be seen and say, yeah, this is what happened. But in the three million, for example, just from the central bank, from here and there, the attempt by Iboma, the attempt by Ito, the attempt by Dubai Climate Foundation, whatever you call it, what do we see out of it? I mean, out of it. So there is something in uh, I, re I really died in my own my discussion with school to what we call returning to a bar spouse or relationship. A wife or husband, boyfriend or girlfriend that has not done any good in your life, that just does nothing but to embarrass you or disgrace you. Then after a while you go back to that relationship. So that how we are with debt. We know what debt is to Liberia. There is the OAU Center, right? The OAU Center. It was financed by them. Why are we getting out of it? All of our SOEs around here, they have never changed, expanded one meter since they were established in the 1960s and 70s. Look at the size of the Freeport. Look at LPRC. Look at the horses. How many new horses estates have been added? On and on and on. Look at our posts. Bikiana, Sando, Maryland Post. These were all funded by debt. We didn't get anything out of it. So the question is, 1.5 plus billion debt in six years, where did they go? And like he mentioned, he also touched on another concept we call uh, uh, intertemporal decision making. The decision you made today, you want to enjoy today, you want to fly to Dubai, you want to do for the eight days tour around the world watching football games. At what cost? Tomorrow, your children, your brother's children, relatives and others will not have money to even ride taxi from Broad Street to Pinsville. Least will talk about them following you to Dubai and other places. So it's a choice that we need to get away from. So whether the ECF is a solution, definitely it's just a temporary measure. When you are wounded, maybe you spray your foot, you use crushes. The crushes is not a permanent leg. So while you're walking on the crushes, you got to be exercising your muscles to make sure that you don't depend on crushes forever. That's why the doctors or even family will tell you, step on the foot, step on the foot. 
because you will not walk on crosses forever. So this movement of reprieve to balance our balance of payment, to have extra resources to maybe make intervention in certain economic ventures is intended like an oxygen treatment. Once your lung begins to function, you take out the oxygen. It's not a long-term solution. It's a temporary measure. So the way you manage it in an emergency is important. I thought you were thinking about you driving the car. You're driving the car and you notice that your tank is almost to zero. You're not going to be using AC. You're not going to be making unnecessary stuff. You will focus on getting to your destination. So on our day program, the main message, in fact, we are broadcasting to the public. But meaning is to our public sector managers, managers of ministries and agencies, and federal government institutions. We have one last chance, one temporary measure to help us get by our feet. In fact, it was because there's a new administration. They know that we are in the transition stage. They know that we are not responsible for the collapse of the 2019 program. And they saw that we demonstrated resolve based on some of the actions that were taken. Based on information, they say, yeah, this book can be trusted. And finally, before I say the acting <laughs> minister, the default or whatever, yeah, the default we are talking about, with the first default is the one for 2024 debt schedule payment. The one that I scheduled this year, they are current, we are current in the payment. Where the default happened was those ones that were scheduled in 2023. We are on schedule with the 2024 payments. Like I said, the only issue was the mismatch between transfer dates and due dates with our creditors. So you will see that by the end of the year, all of our debt schedule for this year will all be paid. The ones that were scheduled for last year were the ones that were not paid. And we have to pay, we have to play cash up. Pay them all before we start payment for 2024 scheduled obligations. <laughs> I think being the what I want to own that. Well, this question is not strange. A lot of people are asked, a lot of people are speculated. But I'm not the president of Liberia. The president has his choice. And for us, we are in a political appointed position, but we are basically technocrats. Even as I said, those who know me, how I work at the Ministry of Finance anywhere, I speak and talk technically. I think you can hear it from my presentation. I'm not into political imagery. So the president will make the choice. And whatever choice the president makes, I can tell you this. We are happy with it. In fact, I have worked with four different finance ministers. I work with Saida, I work with Minister Gafuan, I work with Minister Kone, and I work with Minister Kamara two times. And all of them know our records, both our technical and bureaucratic records. Thank you. Thank you. So let me respond to the questions beginning with the last uh, about injuring uh, people in our raids. Our officers are not prepared or conditioned to injure people whenever they go out. One thing we, we have experienced is that usually these, at these raids, suspects will flee. And in that process, they get injured. But once we gain physical restraint of you, Rest assured, your rights uh, are guaranteed. We're not going to treat you uh, in ways that are dehumanizing. With the New Jersey situation, it was an unfortunate situation because one, the officers didn't, that operation wasn't approved. Uh, we gathered that the same thing, they were sitting in a ghetto, and once the officers arrived, the guy was fleeing, he got injured, and he died for a robber. But the family says something different, so we have to transfer that case to the LMP because. Uh, the issue of a homicide investigation is, is within the province of the LMB, not the LBE. We look for drugs, basically. Um, whether we underestimated the threat, our, our initial assessment informed us that we could go in, strike, and get out. 
But as we continue to review this uh, situation and, and, and look at some of the public comments being made by uh, CDC, we found out that they told the world that they were tip off about our coming, and no surprise we saw how they were able to mobilize and resist the execution of this raid. Uh, spill over our uh, operation did not spill over into the CDC perimeter wall. We, we had nothing to do within that compound, but what did spill over is the attendant violence. We were pelted with stone, we were out of that vicinity by 5 for the 5 in the morning, we were gone. Even the LMP wasn't there. What happened on the Tottenham Boulevard, I think you can be the judge. Because no police were there, no LDE were there between 5.45 to 6 o'clock. And the violence on the Tottenham Boulevard began just between 5.45 and 6 o'clock until LMP went to uh, restore normalcy. The rate. You ask why we can't, uh, I don't know what rate you got. I mean, I, I, we didn't steal any rate. In fact, on the execution of that raid that morning, we had two court officers. So I don't know who stole the raid. But we did apply for the raid. We received raid signed and stamped by the, the, the Western Magisterial Court. Why we can publish the raid? Because names of the subjects on our raid are still under surveillance and investigation. So we can, we can show you, we can put the raid out. We jeopardize the entire, even though at, at some level, it's already been jeopardized, but we're still looking at what we're looking at. We're still working on the joint security to see what decision will be made eventually. So we still have the rates, and if the court calls us, I think that's the best place we could produce that rate, but not currently because it's still uh, on a serious consideration of what we're looking at. Uh, you asked us to name the, 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 the court officers who signed our rate, but also I told you, you asked for about the agents that are, that are injured. They are him or too. You, don't, I mean, are you, not, you, you, you do not care to know their names? Huh? So one of our, in, one of our officers who injured is Agent Mabutu Was. It's a human being. Hmm? Look at the picture. They only want to do a work to make sure we get drugs from <coughs> communities that are affected. The other agent is Agent Daniel Weni. They are human being. Are we not concerned about them too? Look at the stone. So thank you. That's crazy. So that takes me to the proportionality. And I was thinking about well Chris definitely. So my name is Nelson, Nelson Freeman, and I'm the one or two at the police. And I was jump on the question I have to do with uh, the proportionality of our folks. It's a good thing to think about proportionality, but we all have to know that we all have parents. We all have guard rights, irrespective of the uniforms we're wearing. Chris is passionately speaking about his officer. Have you all thought about the officer who's in the hospital? Who's dying, who took that broken? I'm the question from the, the rioters here that got a fracture. But I got to be very hurt. So if I, if I will be honest with proportionality, I think we were down this time around. Our, 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 our proportion was even lesser than the resistance we experienced. And I think you should commend us for, us, for that. <laughs> the principal had pursued uh, 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 from Sheriff. Mr. Sheriff. Arrests are in two folds. They are arrests with warrants, and they are arrests without warrants. In this instant case, we did not go to effect an arrest. This was a plain view doctrine. Crime was being committed in our clear eyes. Why are you saying the police should fold their hands? How are you going to be protected? Do you want us to sit back in the barracks? Do you want us to sit back in our headquarters and our police offices and see the street and more? We're just doing this because we have to protect you. This is what we sign up for. And this is a statutory method. And we will do it again if we have to repeat the service. This is what we sign up for. And we are ready to keep the peace no matter what. Whether or not our presence has exacerbated the situation, they come back to the same thing. Okay, so I'm the, I'm the operational director. Next time I'll give you a try. When people take to the street and start to throw stones, I will keep my guys at the police headquarters. Let me stay for one hour or two hours. Let me see the number of damages that will be caused. Probably you will be the same ones in the room asking for me to be dismissed. Because I can also be dismissed for commission, I can be dismissed for omission. Do you know that? I've got a duty to perform. My failure to perform my duty can cost me my job. 
Look, gentlemen, we all are parents. We are all citizens. We all have got rights in this country. We got nothing against anybody whatsoever. But we have got a duty. We have to keep the peace. If you think you're going to infringe on the rights of other road users, on the rights of other citizens, obviously the police will be out there to make sure you're protected. You got a right to demonstrate, for example. But everybody does not choose to demonstrate with you on the day you're demonstrating. Even you, the demonstrators, must be protected. Because you could come with your good intent. But other people jump among you because they want to make sure that your intentions are now accomplished. What do you expect us to do? Say, fold our hands? No, we are not going to fold our hands. We are going to do what's required of us. Somebody said, uh, attempted murder. I think you should be charging the people who almost came my officers for attempted murder in army. My officer's too is broken, he stayed in the hospital fighting for his life. So obviously if you, if you it's not the, 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 the weapon you use, it's the degree of injury that is sustained. These officers sustained serious bodily injury that will have caused them their lives. What do you expect us to charge people with? Petit last in it? No. We we'll charge you appropriately. One was adopted. In accordance, one was adopted, you drag in the fence. Look, gentlemen, let's get politics out of this. I'm not a politician, I'm a police officer. I've done this all my life for 26 round years. 26 years I've been a police officer. I've had the opportunity to serve in four of the counties in Liberia, Maryland, Nimba, Basel, Bungas County Commando. I've had the opportunity to serve almost all the key sections in the Liberia National Police. I've stayed out of politics. I've never voted for any political party. I stand for my code of conduct. I'm a police officer. My job is to keep the peace and we'll continue to keep the peace as long as we're here. Thank you. Somebody talk about police officers getting dismissed because they didn't wear a helmet. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that. In as much as we're trying to uphold the value of our institution, we're very much concerned about the conduct of our men. Because to enforce, we must uphold. I mean, you, you cannot say, don't do this, and you are the officer who's doing it. I hear you, uh, see what I want to hold down friends from, from the observers. When we were young officers, they kept us all over the place. I heard you talking about uh, the, 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 the doctrine that speak to, 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 what was it? You said violate to enforce. Violate Well, that used to be your old culture where it doesn't exist. There's no reason why you should violate to enforce. To enforce, you must uphold. So those officers were never dismissed. Those officers have been warned. Those officers are cautioned to say, we are asking people to wear helmets. You, the police officer, should be the one to set the example. If you fail to wear a helmet, of course, administrative actions will be taken. Yes, two officers were suspended for not wearing a helmet, but I think the suspension has long been lifted. Sure. And they've, and they've resumed work. So they were not displaced. And that doctrine about violation to enforce does not apply in this age and time. Basically, I don't know if I touched on everything else. And somebody said, what well, our presence exacerbate the situation. We, 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 our presence should never exacerbate the situation, ladies and gentlemen. When you see the peace officer, you should be saying sanity. You should be saying peace. You should be feeling confident. That's why we are opening up to all of our actions. That's why we make sure the professional standard department is robust now in dealing with our own misconducts. We are out there. Watch us. Put the cameras on us. The last time I was at Zone 3, uh, a police officer almost got dismissed because he, he went after a guy who was there from school. He went after somebody from school who took his picture. And we said, why are you going after somebody who's taking your picture? Then it means you're doing something that's not a jail. Put the cameras on us. Watch our everyday dealings. We're not hiding. We don't have anything to hide. We're over here only because we're here. We're paid because of your taxes, and we'll uphold the law to the fullest and ensure that it's sanity in this country. Thank you. I believe you've gotten the response in the air. That's something that I want, I want to inform the press. One of the things here is that it is important for all of us to be resource oriented as we also do information dissemination. The Ministry of Finance and Development Planning, despite all of the debt accumulated and all the challenges we are having, one major thing this government has done is to ensure that we have 
medium term debt strategy to address some of the challenges we face in this country. Meaning, the president approval is that any debt acquired, like Minister Meyer said, those days were, were actually used for investment purposes. So for this reason, go on the website of Ministry of Finance and Development Planning, you'll see the medium term debt strategy, and also we have our an annual borrowing plan to ensure that you forecast what you borrow ahead of time without not just going for any money. I know some people you see that they will borrow money and use it to buy a car, and you see most of the big cars you used to see around, people are riding and money that they took from loan. And like that, it means you are just consuming. You are not investing. So you see the debt, medium term debt strategy will tell you clearly what will go from here. And that's very much important. Some of you, even if you have a time, we can have a you know radio talk show to discuss with the Liberian public how we should manage our economy. It shouldn't be all about government. It should also be about private sector. That's the reason why we gave opportunity to see that even there's a possibility that it can be a guarantee given to SOE, it should be for investment purpose that they can go borrow and say government will stand by you, borrow it, to carry on investment, to improve services, you know, to the country. I want you to please engage our department, communication department, and also engage the ministry as we do, you know, public financial management awareness across the country. Lastly, to the journalists, we are encouraging economic reporting. If it's possible, I will say openly here that we want to have a special session where we engage the journalists on how we do economic reporting. There can be a way you interpret information and people understand it and actually misinform the public as well cause problems. So when it comes to economic data, economic reporting, we want to encourage you if it's possible. I've discussed this informally, but I want to say publicly here that this is where our problem has been. Like real economic sensitivity is very low, political sensitivity is very high. Mm -hmm. Learn how to actually analyze why we make decisions, just how we are eating, what we produce locally, and what it means to import more food. If you understand and interpret it as a media practitioner, you go on the air and explain this, you improve the living standard of Liberian people. But we focus more on the political aspect, political sensitivity. We're not going to grow, and we're not going to go anywhere. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for the one minute. I'm sure Mr. Myers addressed the question that was also referred to me regarding the Dr. Brown's but I, I took interest in the fact that as a media community, uh, you made an allegation that we have to look into. You did say people who went to the Ministry of Finance to protest sent there by a government institution. Uh, we don't know the reliance of your information, but thank you for that information. We're going to go through this And to conclude, you know, I sincerely believe that each of us need a kind of readjustment on what role we want to play to get this country that has been around for 177 years Yes, but still looks the way it is. When a journalist suggests that the presence of law enforcers escalate violence, where is that thought process coming from? <laughs> Like he said, we were just tell them one day, maybe in the same environment, one protest is on. And we say, you should not go there. And you see the difference between the presence of law enforcement and the absence of law enforcement. But the drama is, if you stay away, people get killed, things get damaged, you come back and criticize the same officers. What kind of country do we want? The fundamental responsibility of getting government to protect lives and property. And the people who are lawfully charged to do that on our behalf are the police officers. There's lawlessness somewhere. Where people are causing unnecessary discourse. 
trying to trample upon the rights of others, they will go there. And they don't just go there kicking people out. Take, for example, people black the road when they tie us. What are the police supposed to do? Go back and say, please move the tire from the road. When they say no, they say, okay, let's turn until the tire is running. Is that a country you want to see? Is that a government here? Not interested in going after anybody. Once you do lawful things, when you do unlawful things, the situation will be faced appropriately. And maybe many of you just been here. And some of us will live in different places. But you can see what can happen in other places. You think some of the things you do here can happen in a place like America? Don't you see some of the violent actions there and what security forces can do? Do you know how many people die daily at the hands of law enforcement because they, they, they see some threat that they want to uh, uh, neutralize? The situation that took place at that place on that 21st, 22nd, whatever it was, should be commended the current for handling that situation in a way that didn't make us to see deaths. And most times you just don't care. If you have 20 police officers wondering, you can't answer about it. Or oh, you use violence against somebody, you don't care about that. You think that Robert in their body? These are a lot of people fathers and mothers. But you think because they ain't the blue and white, they should just make themselves available for anything. If you are a journalist, can I even provide that consciousness that portrays the police for what it ought to be? And you will use these events to demonize them. To make them look that people who are in trouble suggesting that something escalated because they went there. What kind of journalists are you then? The police is that arm of the government that ensures that we meet our fundamental obligation of protecting lives and property. We give them the support, we give them the space, and they will operate continuously within the confines of the law and consistent with their own operational procedures. Of course, you know when somebody meets violence. Of course, they got to counter that violence. You know, you went to school, you did a little science, it says for every action, it's an equal action. I know what's happening. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the press, on behalf of the Ministry of Information, Cultural Affairs and Tourism, we'd like to commend the team from the Liberia National Police, the Liberia Drugs Enforcement Agency, and the Ministry of Finance for accepting our invite here to come at the Ministry of Information regular press briefing <coughs> to speak to development in their respective sectors. The speakers have spoken well and have put your questions to them and have gave the answers which I believe are very satisfactory. I just want to emphasize one thing before we go. One of the general acts, the number of tear gas canisters that were fired while the police counted it. I also want to add